Hey everyone, this is Charlie Shrem, and you're listening to Untold Stories. This is a show where we dive deep into the lives and personal histories of some of crypto's most influential leaders and find out how the crypto movement truly came to be. Let's dive in. This podcast is presented by Blockworks Group, the only blockchain event and media production company I trust. For exclusive content and events, that provide insight into the crypto and blockchain space, visit them at blockworksgroup.io. I promise you won't be disappointed. My guest today, we're very special to have him. His name is Mike Caldwell, and he created the first physical Bitcoin, correctly pronounced as Casatius. If you've never heard of Casatius coins before, you've seen them. Almost every article about Bitcoin or cryptocurrency today has the pictures of his physical Bitcoins. It's those silver, brass, or gold-looking coins that on the back say Casatius, and there's a hologram. When you peel it off, it would reveal a private key. Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hi, Charlie. It's it's so wonderful because, and, you know, I grew up very religious. And so when people ask why was the physical Bitcoin so important and so integral to the early days of cryptocurrency— I remind them of a story that you probably know. Um, The ancient Israelites, when they had, you know, told Pharaoh, we let let my people go, they were wandering around Egypt for a while and they had this God and they didn't really have a physical manifestation of God. And then they created what everyone knows as the golden calf and God punished them. And the whole story goes after, but the golden calf was created by the Israelites because they needed some sort of physical manifestation of God to really understand and to believe. And God said, you don't need it. And that was the whole thing. But I kind of compare that to your physical Bitcoin, because I feel like we needed a something to hold in our hands, something tangible to play with and to show people with, in the early days at least, when we're convincing them that Bitcoin is the future of the world. Do you feel the same way? Hey, Charlie, I think that that's a very good example, very good to compare it to. And I, and yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, for, for me, um, when I thought to do the Casatius coin, you know, I, 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 you know, I thought of it in a lot more practical terms. I think, um, you know, when I first came across cryptocurrency, it was, um, you know, I already had a passion for understanding the concept of cryptography, which, you know, lately I have to explain what that is. I mean, most people now know what cryptocurrency is, but cryptography is something that's totally abstract to everybody and always was. Um, but the, what, what I would notice is that when I tried to explain c- cryptocurrency to people in a, in a world where cryptocurrency didn't really exist, I would just get a lot of blank stares. And I mean, I was explaining something abstract. I was excited about something that was totally abstract to anyone I would ever talk to. And, you know, they would look at me like, Mike, what, like, what, what uh, I'm sure their, their, their words weren't saying, Mike, what's your problem? But their thoughts probably were. And so I, um, you know, I mean, this idea of this fantasy currency that existed only on your computer that you could transfer to other computers and never um, could put in your pocket just seemed anything but wonderful. And so, um, you know, when I thought, yeah, you know, I'm going to make it so that you can put this in your pocket. It was almost born out of a utilitarian perspective where I thought, okay, I'm going to hand you something and then you can put it in your pocket and then I can tell you what it is and then you'll get it. And so, um, you know, yeah, when I, when I thought to do it for the first time, I didn't think about, um, you know, I wasn't trying to think about how shiny it's going to be. I just thought about how useful it's going to be. And um, as it turned out, it turned out shiny and uh, it turned out um, much to my liking. Um, And so, um, yeah, to compare it to, uh, you know, the golden calf. um, Yeah, I never thought of it as as of that, but it definitely turned out that way in the end. And I'm pretty happy about that. That's a very interesting point you make that you created it out of your own need to be able to explain cryptocurrency to people but more moreover you were more interested in explaining cryptography to people and i feel like that message is somewhat lost 
when I get up on stage and I give a talk about crypto today, I feel like the topics that I talk about are very much the same. And I'm almost getting up there and reminding people why I, I get up there and I say, guys, like, yes, ICOs and 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 three xing and speculation and making a ton of money and blockchain blockchain this blockchain that but do you understand why and i i get blank stares a lot and then i have to get into the whole byzantine generals problem and how satoshi was able to s solve a generational problem using cryptography and mathematics is that something that you explain to people like how do you explain it because i i could use some help in that how do i explain it to people um well the, the first thing i tend to say when i explain how i explain cryptocurrency is that i've got about 16 ways of explaining cryptocurrency based on who my audience is um i've never point. i have never actually explained the byzantine generals problem to anyone even except maybe outside of the context of computer science classes i know it's it's a big discuss. but but I really like when I bring it down to that and I literally draw it out on a whiteboard and I draw a little city and I draw little generals around and I say, hey, guys, all right. So this is a city that needs to be conquered and all the generals need to be able to invade at the exact same moment or else they'll all fail. And I get into the whole thing and I draw it out for people. And then I say, how would you solve this problem? And then everyone tries to come up with these novel solutions. But at the end of the day, and this is more in a classroom workshop. No one is able to, 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 to show how they would solve the problem. And then I say, well, let me explain to you how Satoshi solved the problem. And then they, they get it. Yeah. Oh, well, that, yeah, no, that, that totally makes sense. You, you may be explaining to more of a technical type of audience who, um, who, you know, would, would, would view the, the problem that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency solves in terms of the Byzantine generals problem. So like right now um, I'm in business school. I thought I would, um, finish up my finance degree and so my day-to-day -day exposure is more around people who are either in you know in finance or management or they you know like one thing i've noticed is that at the business school um the concepts of computer science are a little bit further removed and so um you know like like if i you know like i find myself explaining bitcoin more in terms of triple entry accounting and debits and credits or um you know explaining how uh, how we are automating the process of auditing by using hash as a, as, as a way of checking data. Um, yeah. I, I, like I, I, I think I go back to the, to um, you know, when I, the first thing I explain when I explain explaining Bitcoin is that I've got about 16 ways to do it because everyone ha everyone sees a different slice of the picture. I mean um, the idea, the, the, the whole idea that crypto and Satoshi brought to, you know, brought to us as, as a gift to civilization is so encompassing and takes pieces from so many disciplines that any one individual only really sees the part of the picture that most contains to their skill set or their life experience. And so, you know, if I'm explaining to a, a legal professional, well, then I start explaining, you know, the, the, the whole notion of cryptocurrency in terms of of you know what they see and 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 what's most salient to them whereas if i'm explaining you know it to someone you know well versed in computer science then yeah the, the byzantine generals problem is it, you know since that's one of the you know, one of the basic things we just you know we discuss in when we're you know discussing distributed applications and networking you know there's there there are so many facets to this to the to this discipline that um you know, there's there, there's no one explanation that covers everybody. That's a good point. It depends on who your audience is, right? So you're mostly in business school now. Um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I mean, you were the founder of a of a company called Swipe Clock, and that's what you did kind of before crypto or, or overlapping when you started um, Cassatius Physical Bitcoins. But you know, some would say that you're you're successful in that. Why go back to school? Oh, that's a really good question as well. Why go back to school? Okay, so yeah, you're that's correct. I before I before and during getting into cryptocurrency, I ran a software startup called Swipe Clock. And um, since you know, at, at, at this time, Swipe Clock has new ownership, and um, another company acquired Swipe Clock. Um, the way, and, thank you. Um, yeah, that was definitely adventure, uh, definitely a learning experience, definitely an awesome awesome ride um 
So, you know, when I got into being, you know, a startup founder, I got into it not from a business angle, but from a technical angle. Um, I ended up, um, I mean, Swipe Clock started in essence because I came up with the right technical solution to solve a real world business problem, not because I came along with, with um, superior business skills. I mean, I, I came along with some certain personality traits and tendencies that, that favored me doing well in that. But ultimately what I came with is the ability to come and develop a, an app and, a, and a, a software ecosystem that, you know, the, the customers who use that solution, you know, the, 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 you know their, their behavior and their, their willingness to purchase the services kind of tell us they like it. And so I came up with an app that was, you know, perceived to be of, of high quality in the marketplace. And um, as a result, business people came in and helped me build the business. And so I, I started the business from a tech angle and knew very little about how business works and how accounting works and how marketing works and how operations works and, and all the, all of the different things that need to happen to actually run a business. And so, um, you know, I ran that business for about 14 years before we got acquired. Um, and then my observations were that the people who acquired my business had all these, had all this knowledge and had all these skills and abilities that, that pertain to running businesses as though that was the primary discipline and the technical one was secondary. And so from my perspective back then, um, I was like, wow, this is what I'm missing. Um, these people know how to take a business, make it more efficient, clean up all the, you know, you know, clean up all the loose ends and either, you know, whether they sell it or whether they make it go public or whether, you know, whatever they do with it, they take it and make it into something better than it was before. And, you know, when they would put up, you know, exhibits on the, on the, on the, on the projector screen and I didn't understand them and then use terminology that I was like, you know, like at, at the time I'm like, what's a SWOT analysis? And I mean, now, you yeah, know, I remember that yeah, I've never heard my first that. day of, of, of college. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so just, I, I, I mean, the solution, you know, the, the big clue was, wow, I'm, I'm, I may be the, the technical person in the room, but I'm definitely not the business person in the room. And, um, you know, going to business school was definitely how I felt like I'd be closing that gap. So I expect to, you know, I'm taking one class this summer just because I only have four classes left and only one was offered in the summer. So, you know, come fall and or spring, um, I expect to graduate with my, business degree in finance. Congratulations again. Thank you. It seems like the common denominator here that I can see is that you're sol you're you're starting companies or I wouldn't even say companies, you're you're starting projects that eventually end up very successful to to solve your own problems. So my question to you is what other problems are you having right now because I want to invest in them. Oh yeah, you know what? Um <laughs> Man, you know what? Like, I, I haven't. Here's one problem. I, I haven't spent enough time on a boat lately. Do you have a Do you have a solution for that one? I'll tell <laughs> I mean, you. I need to come on busy. When's the last time we saw each other? Let me tell you something. You're always welcome, and I love it because when I say that, people actually take me up on it. So, this weekend, the week after, and then the weekend after, I have three different um people coming. Some of them that I've never actually met before, but we've talked so much. They're coming to just visit and stay at our place. So you, you and your family are always welcome to come, whether to stay at my house or we have an Airbnb that we run right down the road. You're always more than welcome to come. And <clears throat> excuse me. What I was going to say is I've decided like you to, to explore what I know this is untold stories of Mike, but I'm going to tell an untold story of myself here. Um, I've decided to explore like different avenues and see what I really like and what I really want to do. And growing up in Brooklyn, not really around the water, um, I fell in love with, but with boating in the water and I'm completely self-taught. And now I'm in the process of becoming a captain with the United States Coast Guard. And that's a whole process. And so um, I'm very excited because people have to call me Captain Charlie for, for real. <laughs> but um, I love it. I love boating. And who knows if I'll have a career in it. I don't, I don't think so. Maybe I'll do the, occasional sunset cruise or deliver boats or maybe volunteer on a, on a, on a tugboat or something. But I just, I just love it because it's something completely different from what I've um, ever done. 
That's awesome. I'm glad you um you know you had the opportunity to go and just explore life a little bit and see what you know. I guess this will be the wrong cliche, but floats your boat, you know. I I use that. I probably use that that cliche every single time I'm on the boat. I find a reason. There's all these like boating related innuendos that I'll um that I'll use, and so it's interesting because you know swipe clock is what it is. It, it, you you need you you had a need right and you you basically from what I read you turned these these credit card machines into into timekeeping um, machines be able to, for for employees to come in and and clock in and clock out and I'm sure it it became a lot a lot bigger than that but you found the need and you found a gap in the technology that existed and you implemented that as it came to Cassatius, um it became more of a culture and. Because you got shut down by powers that be, and I'll get into that to that later, um, it became more of a culture. And you know this that books have been written about about it, and they're collectors' items, the coins now, and they're collectors' items in so much that there are actually books that are, that are are for sale, physical printed books that literally all they do is go through all the different types of coins you sold and you printed. And that's very interesting because I don't think that you expected that to happen. Um, did I expect that to happen? No, I definitely did not expect that to happen. Uh, when I first started with this, with the physical Bitcoins, you know, Bitcoin was at like a $2 price point. And yeah, I was thinking about how I could, you know, I was thinking, how can I shave 10 or 20 cents off the off the price of the coin? Because, you know, I was thinking, you know, how can I make this more efficient? Because no one's, you know, people are paying a premium. I like I didn't really so much have the vision. I mean, I mean, we did. We all said, oh, yeah, when Bitcoin's two dollars, we're like, yeah, Bitcoin's going to be pie in the sky. Imagine Bitcoin's a hundred dollars one day. Won't, won't that be awesome? I, mean, I remember that. It, Ten dollars even. <laughs> yeah. Ten dollars, a hundred thousand, maybe even a million. I mean, it sounds it sounds it sounds equally ridiculous. You know, when we say Bitcoin will be a million dollars, you know, people will look at us and say, oh, yeah, you're just optimist. You know, you're just crazy optimist. But that's, you know, how the concept of Bitcoin being even a hundred dollars was back then. Um, and so, yeah, Not I would, to interrupt you for the price to go from ten thousand to one hundred thousand is only 10 X. But from the price to go from one dollar to a hundred dollars is a hundred X. Yeah. No, it's yeah. I mean, I think we all knew that this was going to be a wild ride. I mean, here's one thing too. Um, none of us expected. I mean, it was all the way for back in the beginning. Um, you know, especially around the time you you alluded to me getting shut down. Um, you know, around that time, you know, if I walked into a bank, I was afraid to say I had anything to do with Bitcoin because the the you know, the, the sentiment at the time, uh, you know, what, what was being spoken about it was that oh, Bitcoin is this thing that drug dealers use and it's this thing that criminals use and, and it's money launderers and anyone who is involved in Bitcoin is probably involved in some sort of crime. And so, you know, if, if they say Bitcoin, don't open an account for them. So the one thing that we couldn't have predicted is that Bitcoin, at least today, is widely accepted as, you know, if, if nothing else, I mean, put all technology and cryptography aside, it's widely accepted as a wildly successful investment that some people got in on and got really lucky at. And it's, it's, it's viewed as, as, as legitimate, it's viewed as legal. And if I go into a bank and say, yeah, I do Bitcoin, people, you know, don't look at me like, oh, well, what's his story that, that they're, they're, they're proud of me in general. And then, um, you know, if I, if I come along and say that I ran a business too, that, that adds credibility. So in addition to not being able to predict that, you know, the price would, the price action would be like it, like it, it is in real life today. Um, I would also say it's equally important to point out that the legitimacy or the widely perceived legitimacy is something that we could not have perceived and something we as a community totally lucked out on. It, it, it could have been worse. It could have been bad. It could have, it could have been condemned, you know, if, if um, culture and society at large said, nope, we're, we're, we're against this. We hate this. That's a very important word you just said, luck. And that's something that we all say, and I tell people, it's like, how did you know to get into Bitcoin? And I say, honestly, I was just lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. And I feel you, I feel like you kind of share those same sentiments. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was in the right place at the right time. I took an interest in cryptography before I had heard of cryptocurrency. Um, you know, because it's one of those things that I that the kind of just stood out to me as wow, here's a discipline of mathematics that has such a high potential for utility, but not only is it ignored, but there's actually you know, there's there's actually interests that try to stifle people understanding this. Like you know that that's what caught my attention. It's like why is that? Why is it that there's this branch of mathematics that you know is it, it, I mean it's complex, but it's not like you know, it, I, I mean, it's not outside of grasp, but there, it has so much utility potential. And yet it's treated like I, you know, when I heard that once upon a time, you know, cryptography was treated like a munition and had export restrictions. And there was like a, there was like laws that said that this, this math you couldn't take to another country. I was like, wow, what's, what's so special about this math that the powers that be don't want people in other countries understanding this math? There's got to be something to it. And, you know, there's a lot of, of, of basic principles to it that kind of caught my attention as being, oh, wow, this is very interesting. I'm surprised that we could be teaching this in schools, but we don't because there's so many things that we could do that would add, you know, integrity to society that if people tell, only knew. Tell me how, tell me how cryptography pre-Bitcoin really excited you. Well, here, here, how, did, how did cryptography... Um, excite me. Well, I mean, okay, so one of the basic um, core applications of cryptography is just encryption, getting information from point A to point B safely without the, uh, you know, w without the ability for someone to intercept it or alter it. You know, like, I mean, there's, there's war stories about how, you know, this country, you know, communicated this message to their people in that, you know, in that conflict zone and the message got intercepted and you'd have, you'd, you'd hear stories about how entire teams of people were there to code crack and, you know, with, with with our modern understanding of a, of cryptography, you know, like that would be like game changing for past military conflicts. And so, you know, it, being able to to um, communicate securely and then also to know that you're communicating with the correct person, you know, it's something we take for granted every day, every time. Censorship we resistant. Resistant. Yeah. Non repudiation. The idea that you can sign something. Um, the, the idea that you can sign a document and have full positive knowledge that the signer really signed it is one interesting facet. Actually, here's another thing that really what makes me wonder where in page you know, in, in year 2019, it's really common for us to sign legal documents prepared by legal professionals where it's a 10 page document and we sign signature page 10 and pages one through nine could be reprinted and replaced at will. And it's like, you know, like, or, you know, if, if an accountant publishes or, you know, produces a report um, rendering their opinion about a client and they publish it as a PDF, you know, anyone can go in that PDF and just use, you know, Adobe Acrobat or any number of tools to change that and publish the new one in its place as though it were the original. And most people would know. Um, it's like as in society, like we pretend or, or, or almost oblivious to the idea that that documents can be convincingly altered. Or they're, you know, they, they could be, you know, fake documents could be presented as real. We and, just say it won't happen to us. Yeah, it won't happen to us. Everything or they you would, just described, I, I've, I've dealt with. Um, you know, you have a 50-page agreement and the lawyers just circulate the signature pages. Yeah. It's like, yeah, how do you associate a signature page with the rest of the document? But if somehow yeah, exactly. cri um, with cryptography, we can timestamp or not timestamp, but we can... Um, Every page basically is a, a link in a chain, and if one page gets changed down the road, the whole chain breaks. I mean, that's what cryptography is, and that's what Satoshi needed to solve with 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 money, with finance, with value. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, we we put our trust in so many things that you know. I mean, notaries are still a stamp. You know, you you go get something notarized, and and they pull out a rubber stamp. And all of a sudden that makes it so official enough to be accepted by like immigration control or all kinds of other legal, um, legal authorities. And I'm just like, wow, how hard is it? Like if someone wants to be malicious, how hard is it for them to like, you know, make a fake stamp? I mean, like they could probably make a fake stamp on their printer for all I know. I mean, like what's so special? And so, so in, in Europe, the notary union is one of the uh, oldest like trades and oldest unions that it still exists today. In the United States, it's easy to become a notary. You take a test online, you get your stamp in the mail. But in, in Europe, especially like in Austria or Switzerland, there, there can only be so many notaries 
in and every city only has one or two. So there's like maybe a few dozen in the whole country, and it's like passed down from father to son. Yeah, there is yeah, it's different it, different cultures, different, you know, different practices. I assume that we must have we must come from a long tradition of people where well, geez, it, it worked. It, it's worked for the last how many years? And, you know, no one's broken it. So this old rubber stamp method that I don't know how many hundreds of years old technology that is still good enough in 2019. So, yeah, no, like crypto is one of those things that that um, actually solves all of the problems, all the theoretical problems that go along with, you know, the idea that documents can be altered by page substitution. And so, but, you know, to just to get um, you, before you were talking about, you know, what made me think of getting into, you know, Bitcoin, because you were saying, man, you're so lucky to have chosen Bitcoin as something. I said, I'm so into. lucky. Yeah. You know, we both are very lucky. <laughs> um ultimately um we like i mean for me i got into bitcoin because i already saw crypto as their cryptography as being a solution that solves real world problems and when i heard about cryptocurrency and bitcoin i i feel like i immediately knew what that was even though i had never looked at it because when you know the name bitcoin sounds a whole lot like BitTorrent, which you know is distributed file sharing so when someone said bitcoin i'm like Oh, that must be distributed money that uses crypto as a way of, of securing the system, just like, you know, BitTorrent uses crypto to ensure the, you know, and ensure the, the accountability of the other participants that they're not sending junk to the system. And so, um, you know, that's where the fascination came from. And that's kind of where I felt like I was ahead on the learning curve, because when I started learning about Bitcoin, I had a cryptography background, just a cursory one. I mean, I'm not like a cryptographer or an expert, you know, like a scientist or anything like that. But the, the idea of what cryptocurrency was, wasn't something that I had to climb the learning curve like everyone else does when they hear about crypto excuse me, cryptography for the first time. So my fascination came early and it, I mean, it was luck, but it wasn't pure blind luck because there was definitely a wow, a passion an enthusiasm for me to want to talk about this and say, Hey, here's a world problem. Here's a solution. Everyone look at, th look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this. And it's like, Oh yeah, whatever. So this shiny token, that's now what, what is that? You know? Um, yeah. And so people tell us we got lucky in the end. That's a crazy thing to say because you were the last person to actually need a physical Bitcoin. Someone like me, most people, you know, who got in earlier, even today, um, seeing pictures of a physical Bitcoin or explaining to, you know, I explain it to my grandmother. And the first thing she say, she says, is, is it physical? But you, you, you create things to solve your own problems. You didn't need a physical Bitcoin. You were the last person to need a physical Bitcoin. So why, why create them? I wanted to talk about Bitcoin. And I found that when I had a, an example to put in someone's hand, that people would be like, oh, what's this? And then all of a sudden they would be driving the conversation because the curiosity would be there. But we can't do that anymore. Like the, your physical Bitcoins are so rare and so hard to come by and trade with such a premium now. I remember, I, I can't even think about how many physical ones I've given away. Roger Roger Veer would, would, would show up at my office with, with boxes of the coins, you know, one one Bitcoin coins. And I we would give them away to people just to show them. I remember Christmas, 2012, uh, sorry, Christmas, 2013, I gave a phys one physical Bitcoin as a Christmas gift. And I think it was worth a few hundred bucks at the time. I gave one to like my mother-in-law, my brother-in-law, um, to a lot of people, to just people that I didn't even know that well, just random people. And that my wife, part of my wife's family. And 90% of them still haven't sold it. They still have them. It's their retirement, they say. Yeah, uh, I I never imagined that it would be like that. Like when the, the first day I rolled up a, a roll of, of those physical Bitcoins, I literally went into my office at Swipe Clock and just started passing them out like candy because for at two bucks a piece, you know, that's what that that's basically like giving a bag of M&Ms to everyone. And so, yeah, those those very first ones out on the first day, I just gave them away like they were nothing because like they were giving out bags they of were, M&Ms. Yeah. I love that. So can you, can you, um, walk me through and just because I'm, I'm interested to know from your perspective, walk me through, like, cause you had, you had a lot of different series and you had different versions and you know, different seasons, you could say, and you had some error coins, Like, can you walk me through the first one and then each series and basically like what you remember about each one and how important they were to you? 
Yeah, well, let's see. Where do I start? I have to, um, yeah, where do I start? The 2011, 2011 error coin. 2011. Yeah, the error coin. It's funny how the error even came to be because you want to know what? Like, I'm a. I'm there was an error, 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 wasn't there? There was an error. There was an error. Yes, the, the casatius was spelled wrong in the small print. And I was so embarrassed because to me, like, to me, I, I'm, you know, like, spelling is actually a strong point for me. So to have a spelling error on a coin, I was, I was like, I can't believe this. Yeah. So, um, okay. The, the, the idea originally came about because I was convinced that I wanted to create something physical to hand to people to say, okay, now you have a Bitcoin in your hand. And so the idea was, okay, I need something that, that, you know, shows, um, proof of, you know, that, that the item hasn't been tampered with. And the original idea that I had in mind was just go over to Home Depot and get some washers because I needed a metal object with some space in the middle. I was thinking, okay, I'll go get some washers and then print a private key, stuff it in the hole of the washer, and then put two holograms on the outside as a way of saying, okay, here you have a Bitcoin. But oh then God. when I, yeah, that's literally what I was going to do. Um, but when I went and priced it out and learned what the price of a hologram was, I'm like, okay, if I buy a washer, then I've got to put two holograms on it. And the price of those holograms, if I can go and only put one hologram, then I'm actually saving enough per unit to, to go and actually get custom, you know, brass tokens printed up for me. So instead of using washers, why not I just go contact a company that produces arcade tokens and have them produce me a custom, basically, arcade token. So that's what I did. Um, so the first, you know, the, the first 2011 series was a brass arcade token. And instead of having a hole in the middle, I just asked for an impression where a piece of paper could be could be fit. And kind of the way that works is I just asked for the impression. And then once I got the first prototypes of the coins, I started shopping around for the right paper that would fit the impression and then still leave the sticker flush when viewed from the outside. And so that was, that was the first Casatius coin from 2011. And the way the hologram came about and the way the spelling error came about is I contacted a company that produces and designs holograms and said, okay, here's what I'm doing. This is what I want in it. You know, I want this overprint, you know, I gave them all the details and all the information of what I wanted. And they came back to me with two samples and you know, here's sample number one and here's sample number two. And, you know, they went to me, you know, you know, I looked at them and I was like, okay, I really like sample number one. And I went and I'm like, okay, so I'm sitting here thinking sample number one is going to be the one that I choose. And so I'm inspecting it closely and I'm looking very, you know, fine detail, zooming it in, taking a look. And, you know, when, when I'm about to go and commit to the order and say, okay, I've chosen my, I've made my choice. Sample number one is the one I want to go with. And, you know, so the, the, the rep from the hologram company was like, okay, well, let me tell you about sample number two. Um, sample number two has got this big B in the middle that has, um, you know, like the, the, the appearance of the B looks like it kind of pops. It's got some angles on it that make it look like it's, you know, it's, I would call them like little 45 degree angles that, you know, give it a three dimensional look that just wasn't visible in the sample. And he, he pointed out to me, okay, when you look at this, at, at this image on the screen, it doesn't do this justice. You're going to really love how this B looks in the middle and you, you, you just have to wait till you see it. And he's like, Mike, I recommend that you go with, with, um, you know, solution number two or sample number two, if, you know, all else considered. And I thought about it for a second. I'm like, okay, this guy probably knows what he's talking about. So I said to him, yep, I'll go with number two. Well, guess what? This <laughs> yeah. is a crazy story. Yeah. So, so, so I never how many forced- were printed. How many were, so you got the holograms and how many did you, you, you didn't notice the, the spelling error right away or did you, because you printed how many coins and then sold them with the spelling error? How many, how many Bitcoin worth? Oh, to be honest with you, I actually don't know. Other people have done a good job of running stats, and off the top of my head, I I don't know. So, you know, I'm I'm going to be safe as not trying to give numbers because if I try to say, they'll be my guesses, and they're going to be true. Wrong. For the for those listeners who'd like to know, there's a website called Casacious C A S A S C I U S dot uberbills dot com, and that website has all the stats about how many coins are in circulation, how many moved how many were created for each coin and it's a very interesting website to follow around yeah that's that's that that's a there's there's that's definitely one of the websites i would send people to to get stats so yeah i did a whole run on those but i was like man like i was so embarrassed i mean in the end you know people 
you know, treasure those coins and, and prize them even more. I mean, okay. Like there's, if there's a spelling error on a coin, you know, it brings up, you know, I mean, the plausible point is, okay, if you can't even be bothered to spell your own name correctly on a coin, then how should I trust that you did a good job of, you know, putting a proper private key inside the coin. And yet I was meticulous on that. I just made the foolish mistake of not giving sample number two, the same level of fine tooth comb pouring over as I gave sample number one. I just assumed they came from the same mold. So, you know, how different could they be? You know, I just assumed that, you know, I, I spell checked the one and never thought that I really needed to look closely at number two as well. So, um, so in the yeah. beginning, how did you print the private keys? So each, each um each coin has a mini a mini private key engraved on on the not engraved to print it on the back of the of the hologram and when you remove the hologram you'd know that the hologram was removed and that the the key was you know exposed and so if you ever got a a, a coin that had the 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 hologram removed you'd know about it and so how did you go about securing and printing the private keys on the first coins and how did you automate it or knowing you wanting to make everything more efficient? How did you make it efficient over time? Oh, how did I go about printing the private keys? Well, I mean that the, the you know, you almost could expect grandiose answer, but really all I really did was I went down to office depot and picked up a printer that only had USB connectivity. And I printed it with a normal printer that, you know, is very typical of what you probably already have on your desk right now, just a regular inkjet printer, but I did take care to make sure that I chose equipment that wasn't going to connect to networks or the internet at all. Cause I, um, I literally destroyed all the equipment afterwards with a baseball and, bat. Um, you know, some of the, I didn't use a baseball bat. Like that um, scene with off with office, uh, office space when they go out with the printers and they, they with the mafia music playing and they hit the, I don't know if you've seen that movie. They hit, they, they start beating up their printers and their computers. Oh yeah, no, we had fun with the printer. So I take, I, I, when I was done with the printer, I, I, um, you know, I took it to my kids and said, let's take apart a printer. And we just, just, we just trashed this printer and we took the printer apart. And the only thing I did to make sure that I super trashed was I located the memory chips on the printer. Not that I was worried that the prim, the printer was going to memorize my print job because that's pretty paranoid, but I found the, the, you know, I found the flash memory on the printer and just, you know, just jabbed at it with a screwdriver but yeah we just took the printer apart as an exercise of taking something apart and then the hard drive took it apart ground up the platters you know we and and then i, I had also used some some like usb sticks in the process i hit those with a hammer and you know um yeah we i physically destroyed that that was you know i don't know why it was it was, it was symbolically fun because i was pretty convinced that this equipment wasn't going to be memorizing my stuff but you know, I, that I did, I took really good care to make sure that, you know, I had 0% possibility of those keys being recoverable, even whether by, you know, whether by accident or by someone who, you know, discovers them or was able to identify the equipment years down the road in a landfill or something like that. I didn't want that. Or even you, you'd want people, you want people to know that you had no ability for, for, getting back the private keys. Oh, absolutely. I don't want people to believe that I am, you know, a, the custodian of who knows how many millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin that they could come and, you know, come after me for. I didn't even want that as a possibility. No, I didn't want, I didn't want the feeling of the temptation. I didn't want any, anything associated with it. So to me, I don't even think about it day to day because I know that those private keys are long gone. So, you know, I've actually had people contact me. It's like, Hey, I lost my, my item got stolen. Do you have the private key? And the answer is nope. Sorry. I don't, you know, that's all there is to it. There's nothing else to say beyond that. Well, you decided to have fun with this too, because you didn't just print a one Bitcoin uh, brass coin. You eventually started printing um, and, and, and forging, you know, I don't like to say the word minting, but you're forging these, uh, coins that were in one, five, 10, 25 Bitcoin denominations. You created these bars, you created uh, silver coins, you had gold coins. I mean, you literally created a whole different, uh, series of these, of these coins. Yeah. Um, at the time I was using, I was on the Bitcoin talk forums and as people, as I would, you know, talk with people, people would say, Hey, wouldn't it be nice if you had this? And wouldn't it be nice if you had that? And I'd go down the rabbit hole of looking into what it would cost to produce them. And, you know, as it turned How out, many businesses were created on the Bitcoin talk forums, including my own. Oh yeah. 
that's the, you know, someone's probably figured that out. I'm sure I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone has gone through and, you know, considered the BitTalk, the Bitcoin talk forums as, you know, good research, good archival material to, uh, you know, of Bitcoin history. But yeah, probably many. I, I didn't realize that you credit Bitcoin talk for creating, I, I'm assuming the, um, you know, the, the bit instant business you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, so bit instant was created the same way yours was created. It was, I was literally on the Bitcoin talk forums and in May of 2011, and I saw a post by this guy named Gareth Nelson, UK, that was his username. And he said, Hey, I have a, I have an idea to make it faster for people to buy Bitcoin. And I had just, I had just gotten, um, I had just bought Bitcoin from Mount Gox at the time. And I was like, this is freaking difficult. And then I tried to buy Bitcoin from Jared Kenna at Trade Hill and who was just a guest on the show as well. And that was crazy because his bank account got frozen like that same day. And I was like, this thing is going to fail if we can't make it easier to buy Bitcoin. Yeah. And so um, G- Gareth uh, had an idea and on the, and I, and you could literally, I, I've pointed people back to this post. You can see the conversation between me and him. And I was like, tell me about the idea. And he's like, this is the idea. And I said, all right, well, I'll give you a thousand dollars and we'll, I'll give you a thousand dollars and we'll own the idea together. And he's like, great. And so then privately offline on, we, we met up on, on IRC, you know, and on the, on the free node network. And, um, we came up with the idea actually bit instant was called fast mountain Gox pay. That was the original name for it, but it's all started on, on a Bitcoin talk thread. Yeah, wow. That that was that's definitely a loud or a, a long name. And now that Mount Gox is a little bit of a connotation today, it sounds almost <laughs> yeah. like you know you, you by by all perspectives you did well by choosing the name that you ultimately chose. And I, I remember I did exactly one transaction with BitInstant just to try it, and um, it was just off the cuff. I went to Walmart, and I think it was for a really trivial amount, and I don't even remember. I remember it worked. Probably use the red I, phone. Use the red phone. Did you have to use the red phone? A lot of people have to use like MoneyGram locations had a red phone and you have to pick up this red phone. But um, what was very interesting was even even as as recently as like 2014, he, when someone would pitch you a, a company idea, not just like an ICO, but a, a company idea, um, Coinbase and the likes and all these different companies. The first thing you'd say to them is, where's your big where's your, your Bitcoin talk thread? Like, I want to see. Um, the thread, you know, because all the the, the users on, of Bitcoin talk were so and still are so, but it's it's diluted too much and it's gotten very trolly. But the users of Bitcoin talk, especially what your status was, are you legendary status? Were you how many posts did you have? What was your status on Bitcoin talk? Were seen as like the due diligence of the industry. So if you didn't, if, when you make a thread and you survived five pages of people ripping your idea apart you'd be then seen as investable or successful oh yeah i never thought of it that way but i could see that as being a valid um a valid perspective uh, you know a valid way to do due due diligence on people because at the time you know scams were a plenty i mean you'd have you know you had ponzi schemes you had you had you know casinos you i mean it like when crypto was first came out it was ripe territory for scammers because there was all kinds of new scams possible by the technology that people just hadn't caught on to how to avoid. So yeah, I, um, totally. I can see that as legit. And so um, these coins were very popular over time, over the, over the next few years. And I think somewhere um, on this Uber bills website and we're taking it for granted, you know, we don't know how accurate it is, but it seems like it's pretty accurate because it links to, you know, all the, all these different um, it links to the threads and, and, and links on the blockchain looks like you created somewhere around 27,000 different coins and bars and different denominations ranging from 0.1 Bitcoin to, to you even had two, you even had three 1,000 Bitcoin um, bars created and coins um, somewhere in total of around 90,000 Bitcoin. And it looks like um, out of those 90,000 Bitcoin, um, less than half or are, have been opened. So you still have somewhere on 40,000 Bitcoin worth of of these things that still haven't been taken up from the hologram and they're trading. You know, you see there's like secondary markets on eBay and on uh, Bitcoin talk and on open bazaar where they, you know, especially the error coins trade at a, at a very high premium. Um, why, why did you stop? What happened? Oh, why did I stop? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I had to stop at some point. Um 
Why did I stop? Well, there was a lot of reasons. Um, one of them was that um, I was making all the coins personally. I didn't really like I. OK, you know how I was really concerned about making sure that the private keys, you know, are intact and are as you know, I mean, like I don't I don't believe I made a single private key error. And you can only be that meticulous to, to a certain scale before you have to change something. So I was I was hand stuffing every single private key in every coin and it started to get to the point where it's like wow um that's what i'm doing that's like that's like i mean like i I didn't mind doing that but then um you know it started to become you know the the price of bitcoin was going up and here i am now dealing with collectibles that are worth you know hundreds and a thousand dollars a piece and you know that like when i first thought of the idea these bitcoins were like two bucks a piece and so you know, I I, ha- I didn't feel like I had the security in place that was necessary for handling that high volume worth of value. I was thinking, man, someone's just gonna come and rob me for these. I don't want it, like hot potato now. And then it's too much of a so, risk. Yeah. Yeah. So risk, and then there was there was the time involved. I, I mean, if I'm spending all my time stuffing coins, then I don't really I'm not really putting time in place to consider things like how to you know you know, do regulatory compliance. I mean, keep in mind, this was just a hobby. This was like, how can Mike, you know, start conversations about Bitcoin? You know, like someone who approached it with a, at a bit from a business angle that says, okay, we're going to invest this much in security. We're going invest, to invest this much in regulatory compliance. We're going to have a compliance officer. We're going to have all these controls, procedures, and audits. You know, someone who approached it from a business perspective would have a great deal of success doing it. I just approached it from, well, geez, I could get, you know, arcade tokens instead of washers and save 12 cents a piece. You know, like I, I approached it as a hobbyist. And so I, like I was literally in over my head when, you know, FinCEN was like, well, you need to register as a money transmitter and you know follow a, a, a i mean my legal counsel at the time was saying yeah it's the second you register you are on the hook for you know all these regulations that quite frankly we don't even understand because that's not our expertise you'll have to have a compliance officer and you'll have to have you know legal counsel that specializes in all this stuff and i'm just thinking you know forget it like because on top of it all you know I'm asking people to trust me that I'm not going to steal their cryptocurrency. And I don't even want the question out there. I don't want people even questioning as to whether I could steal it. And the more coins I produce, I mean, I'm basically trying to tell people, okay, here's a good way to hold a couple bucks in your pocket. But as a best practice, having someone else be trusted to not steal your money because they have your private key is actually bad. It's a terrible security. idea. Terrible idea. Yeah. And so, you know, at two dollars, no one cares. If I can, it's like Charlie. If I can rip you off for two dollars, I don't think you care. You you can, you know, it's it, it, it's gonna, you know, it's the price of your coffee or your coke in the morning. But when it's like eight thousand dollars, it's just like okay. Now it's people start to wonder. Okay, people have killed over scam. eight thousand dollars. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, this is just becoming more of a risk. Um, I've already succeeded. At at getting people to talk about Bitcoin. Now it's bigger than I ever imagined it's going to be. And it literally is time for me to move on. So I, it was, it was, it, it was actually an easy decision for me to make. It's like, okay, clean break, got to be done with this. Um, that was great. This was nice. Yeehaw, hooray. Wow. Okay. I'm now I'm going to do something else. It's interesting because um, I had to shut down BitInstant for very similar reasons. We were, the whole concept of, of BitInstant was to to get Bitcoin in the hands of as many people as possible. Very similar to you, we um, Bitcoin was trading at two dollars, three dollars. It wasn't a, it wasn't a huge thing, but at some point it got so big. And then in 2013, the government came out with the the famous FinCEN letter, which basically said that anyone you know dealing in Bitcoin is considered a money transmitter. Um, I remember very 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 specifically, not very long after, I got a call from my lawyer and said. Basically, you're now considered money transmitter. You need to get these licenses or shut down and or, or we can't represent you anymore um, because you're now operating in, in a very gray area that we don't like. And and I basically had to shut down the company very almost instantly because for very similar reasons. But, you know, the, the answer that you just gave, you know, um, I I understand and I can, can can completely empathize with because I feel the same way. Um, I feel like BitInstant had its place in the early days of, of, of crypto, but by the time we shut down, there were so many other companies doing a better job at, than us with with the, with the cost, with the ease of use, with the security aspect of things, um, Coinbase being one of them. And so by the time we shut down BitInstant, I was saying to myself, you know what, 
There was a there was a need for this. We helped create and we helped put Bitcoin on the map and get as many people talking about Bitcoin and using Bitcoin as possible. And there just doesn't there isn't a need for us anymore. So I don't regret or feel bad having to shut down the company. Yeah, I'm with you. We we did what we needed to do at the time we needed to do it. But at the end of the day, someone else is going to do a better job of it. Like, I'm not the best person for the job to go and run it. I'm the best person maybe to have started it. And maybe you were the best person to, to start Bit Instant. But like, I don't know about you, but if I try to put myself in your shoes and imagine you as the CEO of Western Union, I'd be like, ah, is this a joke? Like, there's so much there's so much more to it. I, like, I couldn't do it. It's just not my expertise. I and completely I, agree no with you. In that. And do I, you, I mean, so the, the, the question is, do you have any plans to like start a new series down the road just for nostalgic reasons or you're completely done with it? You know, maybe I would actually be open to the idea of producing things that um, are, you know, I mean, they don't have to have Bitcoins embedded. You know, if I mean, Casatius is a brand that is established for, you know, for having the story that it had and it has its place in history and a place in the marketplace. And, um, you know, um, it would have to be for nostalgic reasons. Oh, absolutely. And so the, there are a lot of people, you know, no offense. And you know this already. There are a lot of people nowadays creating physical Bitcoins that are doing a lot better job in, in how they're printing the private keys and how they're securing it. I own some of them, but none of them were the first and none of them have the nostalgic reasons and none of them. <clears throat> existed or had to shut down for the same reasons that a lot of early crypto companies had to shut down. So I don't know, like maybe you partnering or with a company that has the money transmitter licenses to actually sell coins with a private key on them, maybe BIP38, you know, so there's a, a secondary password could be a really cool idea for you. Maybe, maybe could be i I've, I've considered it um i think my track record for the integrity of my coins is perfect and in a way i almost don't even want to jinx it um you know so i it's either that or produce something that that is instead of being a functional physical bitcoin because it's almost like been there done that you know i mean i almost want to you know throw out the idea of you know being a label to wear as opposed to have being a functional um you know a, a functional piece of utility I mean, what do you think of that? You know, if it was, you know, I like I was at a dance recital not too long ago for, you know, ages, you know, four to 14. And they had like 48 different little sub themes. You know, there was kind of like, you know, Bruno Mars. And then they were kind of like, you know, Valentine's. Sure. And one, of, one of the one of the themes was money, money, money. And the, the dancers would come out and they would dance and they're all dressed in green sparkles. And there's a video playing in the background that they're all dancing to and music playing. And they're showing dollars and gold. And then all of a sudden there was a scene where they showed bitcoins. It's like, oh, wow. Even at a, at a dance recital for teenage and for children and teenagers bitcoin is widely associated with money to the point that whatever company is producing the background artwork video artwork for these dance recitals that they are including a a, a, a little a video clip of bitcoin because bitcoin is in 2019 money and i'm like wow wow i and, know you, you would never you know, think that i would prefer if you never printed coins again and because it it, it it like you said preserves the integrity and the um, the nostalgia of it, but what I do think needs to happen is more people need to be talking about you know your story and and these stories, and that's the reason I created this podcast is to basically preserve that that history that only exists on the Bitcoin Talk forums and and things like that. And I can only do so much, and I have to give credit to someone like Mo Levine who, um, you know, um, last year at the at the Bitcoin Miami conference that he did, he actually had a pop-up Bitcoin museum Oh wow! and had some of your coins in there and other things. He had a little, you would, it would be a, it was a pop-up walkthrough museum. So there was a little, it was, it was a, it was a, an enclosed tent. So it was a tent that was enclosed and it had little pathways and you'd enter and you'd exit a, at a different place at, and it was a little pop-up museum and everyone loved it. And what kind of, I have to be honest, what, what got me a little scared and it was like a punch in the face, a little, not a punch in the face, but like a wake up call was most people who went through these, went through the museum and who call themselves. Cause I was waiting kind of outside the museum and talking to people like, what did you think? And I have people that call themselves early adopters or whatever you want to say. 
they were coming out of this thing saying, wow, I didn't know about all this. And I'm like, oh my God, how bad are we at like preserving our own legacy and our own history? Yeah, well, we, we I mean, we are a community. We do have an exciting story to tell. And I guess early is a relative term. I remember being in a group of people who, you know, called themselves early adopters and they joked to one another, hey, guess what? I heard that, M- that Mount Gox is, was actually MTGOX, Ma- Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. Can you believe that? And these are people who had never um, traded on Mount Gox before, let alone known its, known its first owner, let alone its second I mean, assuming, I mean, I, I, only, I became first familiar with Mount Gox when it was Jed. Yeah. Um, before it was Mark. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Most people don't Mark. even know that though. Yeah. And yeah, so the I remember... quote I said in the beginning was, <clears throat> the quote I said in the beginning was the past is not dead. It's not even past. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. I, I'm with you on that. And then there was a past, there was a past even before me because Satoshi, you know, this is kind of funny. Satoshi disappeared from the Bitcoin talk forums, like less than 24 hours after, before I registered for the first time, which was kind of eerie. Um, I never got to talk to Satoshi and I missed him by a day. Do you remember when that was, what date that was? <laughs> oh, it was in, it was in December of 2010. I don't remember the exact, like which day or time it was, but I remember if you look at Satoshi's last post in my registration time, they're within 24 hours of each other. That's insane. The gap. So, you know, yeah. So you're not really an early adopter. Yeah, I'm not early enough. <laughs> I, I missed, and I think I, I think I was late to the party for the, the Bitcoin pizza. And, you know, I was like, you know, I just hadn't encountered it. I just, you know, I don't, I honestly don't even remember what website or what I was on where it was, we accept Bitcoin. Because as soon as I accept, uh, as soon as I saw the word Bitcoin, I immediately thought a BitTorrent. I thought, wow, is it, is there crypto based money out there? And I, I, whatever I was doing, I just, dropped all threads of thought and went straight to what is Bitcoin? I want to, you know, and I wish, the, I wish I remember era, what the reference was. The era that you're talking about, um, the era, the few years ago that you're talking about, it's a very good point to make. And I've never made that before that Bitcoin and BitTorrent were so close together. But at that time, you know, 2010 to 2013, BitTorrent was at its height and it was huge. And this was when the pirate base started going through their crazy, um, you know, takedowns. And I actually, I'm going to have one of the founders of the Pirate Bay on one of my next episodes, which is, I'm very excited to interview him. But Satoshi definitely, when he created the name for Bitcoin, had in mind that he was going to be, you know, kind of piggybacking off of the reputation of BitTorrent because pe- people understand basically how BitTorrent works in that you're not downloading something from a centralized server, rather you're downloading a file from bits and pieces from other people all over the world. And that's essentially what Bitcoin is. And so they're, they are actually very similar. Yeah. Well, in the in sense that it's a, it's a distributed network that uses cryptography to make sure that all the participants on the network who are anonymous are following the rules. I mean, that's, that's, that's just it. Cryptography in general is something that helps anonymous participants agree that everyone's following the rules. And so, yeah, that's, I think the reputation that BitTorrent um, made for itself because BitTorrent is censorship resistant and anyone can participate in um, BitTorrent. But if someone is a is a bad actor, like po- tries to put you know a bad copy of a file or you know poison the well, so to speak, the crypto rats them out and causes them to be excluded by the system. And that principle, I think, is what Bitcoin th- that reputation. I mean, I mean, the reputation is hey, it just works and no one can shut it down. But those are the reasons you know why it works and bitcoin gets to borrow from that reputation and in part by using the name and and now you know how many years later 2010 2019 you know bitcoin still works the way it did whereas you know you just expect that it just works you do a transaction and it it gets confirmed into a block within the next you know 10 minutes typically and you know that's yeah that that reputation has not worn out at all in the last nine years you're making the point that because Bitcoin is unchanged and still does the same thing, largely unchanged that it has been doing since 2010 is one of Bitcoin's major assets. Whereas other blockchains fork and change and, you know, very few, there are small groups of people who have control over it. And you know that a lot of detractors or Bitcoin haters that are that are not no coiners, but people that are in other blockchains like like Ripple and the like. This is what they use as an argument against Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is unable to change. 
Oh, uh, you know, it is what it is. I mean, I suppose for, but from some perspectives, you know, the fact that it can't change and it is what it is. I don't want it to change. Yeah, I don't want it to change. I mean, yeah, it, it won't have, you know, Ethereum has a lot of features that Bitcoin, it will never have. And I'm happy with that. That gives Ethereum value and that gives Bitcoin value because Bitcoin value, a lot of Bitcoin's value, in my opinion, comes from the fact that it is the first. It's the it's the prototype. It's still around and it can be expected to likely never change in the ways that other blockchains have changed one so, of the founders one of the founders of ethereum on this show has 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 come on and said that um and i checked and it's true that vitalik originally wanted to put ethereum on the bitcoin blockchain but it would have required some technical changes that the that the bitcoin community at the time was very against and oh that's yeah what forced him to start his own blockchain well, that was smart because um, the thing is that to understand Ethereum requires a much longer, deeper learning curve. And there's probably more of a, you know, there's probably a, a, a lot more vulnerabilities and threats. I mean, Attack they're both vectors. very secure, but like, you know what, I mean, Bitcoin, it wouldn't be, no one's trying to improve the, fo the functionality of Bitcoin and trying to deepen the way smart contracts work on Bitcoin. We just know Bitcoin has, you know, it works this way and, you know, there's some extra scripting capabilities and there's the ability to do this and that on it, but by and large, the the simplicity, the relative simplicity, and the fact that Bitcoin is expected to never support this extra complexity is part of the value, and it allows people to wrap their heads around it and feel like, hey, I get this, and you know, feel confident putting their resources into taking risks on Bitcoin. That's the most important thing that we could possibly ask for in terms of this this thing that that we're doing here called Bitcoin. Yeah. Well, and I think the, the world has wrapped their, you know, people have wrapped their heads around the idea that there can be more than one cryptocurrency. You know, for the for the longest time, you know, there was only Bitcoin and any other kind of competing altcoin. You know, some people would see that as a threat, as though that would take away from Bitcoin, you know, and then, you know, and then, you know, some things, you know, sometimes bad things happen, but it ultimately has a good outcome in the end. And as I say this, I'm thinking about the, you know, the Ethereum, how they had the DAO hack. And how, you know, Ethereum forked for the first time and then all of a sudden Ethereum became the template for helping people understand what happens if a fork is necessary and if there ends up being two competing views. And at first I thought, you know, well, if Bitcoin forks, well, that's the end of it. But then we saw Ethereum fork and then it's like, oh, wow, OK, there becomes a market for both coins and then one you know, one one end of the fork ends up being dominant and here's what happens to the dominant side of the fork. Here's what happens to the non-dominant side of the fork. And then all of a sudden, oh, you don't want to know what? Forks aren't a bad thing. They're just, they are what they are. And then so the first time we had a fork in Bitcoin, it was like, oh, no, no big deal. We're going to have a fork in Bitcoin and we know what to expect. And so, um, you know, that this, this um, you know, the fact that Bitcoin is what it is and hasn't been, you know, the guinea pig for, you know, for example, what happens when a cryptocurrency has to fork, I think it gives it um, solidarity and solidity. Uh, uh, I guess that's a bad pun right there because that wasn't intended. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, that, that, the Bitcoin, that, that gives Bitcoin a status. Solidity of, is the programming yeah. language for Ethereum, for those who don't know. Yeah, yeah, that was, that was, yeah. That, that was, was funny. That, that was, was good, unintended. Yeah, good Freudian slip, if that's the right term there. Um, yeah, so th that gives Bitcoin, you know, the the um, status for what it is. You know, there was a time when Bitcoin's transaction fees were escalating so high and all of a sudden that, you know, made people ask the question, hey, wait a sec, Bitcoin is no longer use usable as a currency because I can't buy a can of soda with it without incurring a $40 transaction fee. And it caused people to say, okay, well, Bitcoin's good for this and other coins are good for that. But now Bitcoin is still the lingua franca for funding, you know, other accounts because everywhere, it, you know, if you're going to accept crypto, well, you got to accept Bitcoin. It was first. So it's now standing in a way, you know, less so on its ability to be used for soda pop purchases and now for its ability to be accepted everywhere for being the first. So is that has, a problem? Is that a problem? Is, is which a problem? Because is, I think is, it's a non-problem. Is it a problem that, that you, Bitcoin is too, well, you know, Bitcoin on the main chain, I should say, because the Lightning Network solves those problems. But is it a problem that on the Bitcoin network, you can't buy a cup of coffee? Um. Well, it's actually better that you can. I mean, if you if you can with a Lightning Network and you're willing to accept, you know, the setup complexity and understanding what's going on to to buy a cup of coffee on the Lightning Network, then sure. But the fact is, you know, the the I mean, if we're if if we view it as an asset that Bitcoin is least likely to change, 
you know, in terms of what it is and how it works. And it's only good for funding, you know, large volume payments where you want to make single large transactions instead of lots of little ones, then it's probably a good thing that it stays, you know, simple and isn't, isn't evolving. I mean, the lightning network is, you know, a layer that, you know, ultimately doesn't change the base um, case of what Bitcoin is because it does something separate and only, you know, eventually reconciles to, to the, the main blockchain. But, um, you know, the idea that I can't buy a cup of coffee with Bitcoin is probably about as disappointing as the idea that I can't go to Starbucks and buy a cup of coffee with a wire transfer. It just doesn't make sense that the, you know, the, the building blocks and the fundamentals of, you know, the Fed wire system are such that it's meant for buying real estate, not coffee and by the cup. So, and no. so that solution in itself for, you know, that, that example you just gave of buying real estate and, and needing to use a check or wire transfer and, and having the settlement, you know, having settlement attorneys because you're paying them escrow, which costs a few thousand dollars. And I, I just dealt with this and dealing with that whole thing. It'll be a lot easier if you can do a real estate transaction settlement with Bitcoin because the transaction would take seconds, wouldn't require escrow attorneys. And yes, if I'm paying four dollars for to settle a real estate transaction, I'm I'm willing to pay twenty dollars for that. Yeah, exactly. Whereas I just would never pay twenty dollars for a cup of coffee unless it's like DoorDash. You know, if it's if it's a cup of coffee brought to me, but I don't think I you know every cup of coffee merits space on the blockchain because that's a scarce resource and there just enough isn't enough to go around for everyone's cup of coffee. And it's okay because we want Bitcoin to be you know we we still want the the blockchain to grow at a rate that is still within grasp of people to be able to download it. And I'm not going to download everyone's cup of coffee for any reason whatsoever. No you're right. You're paying. right because you have to download every uh, the blockchain. But the point that you're making is 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 a point that I agree with that largely the Bitcoin community agrees with. But going back to 2013, the argument that the point that you're making now was con was considered crazy. And I'll tell you exactly why. When Eric launched Satoshi Dice and for those who don't know, Satoshi Dice operated on the main Bitcoin blockchain and it was the ability to to bet on because be, the Satoshi dice was the, basically the ability to make bets on, you know, if, if you roll a dice, if the number was greater, the greater than or less than, and you pick the right number, you'd win your bet, whether it's when you double your money or whatever it was. But these were largely all these little microtransactions, you know, pennies or 10 cents or a dollar or whatever. Luke Desheer came out, um, one of Bitcoin's developers in 2013, and he was very against Satoshi dice. He said that it's considered spam. We don't need this stuff on the Bitcoin blockchain. And I was one of those people who says, Luke, you have no right to tell me what I can or cannot do on the Bitcoin blockchain. But nowadays I'm looking back and I'm saying, you know, Luke was right. Yeah, he, I, I, I think both perspectives are right. In, in, in retrospect, I'm glad that Satoshi Dice and all those spam transactions happened because that allowed us to stress test the network and kind of get a, an early sense of what happens once you once you put more volume on the network. But it's volume that's non-committal. It's volume that can disappear and doesn't have economic value. So it's volume that if, if all of a sudden there became a cost to playing Satoshi Dice that was you know $40 a transaction, people would leave. And so it gave us the ability to have foresight into how the network was going to scale and what we could anticipate. Oh, so I'm, and that's what I'm happened. Eventually, they put Satoshi Dice on the Ethereum blockchain or something. I don't even know what happened to it. And that's, and that's essentially what happened. Yeah. Um, it was priced out, and that's okay. That's that's the way that it should be. I mean, markets are efficient when we allow them to be, right? Yeah, I'm I'm with you. Um, yeah, because uh, like uh, Satoshi Dice effectively could be um, viewed as spamming the network. It be, it, it's just simply giving people an economic incentive to spam the network because that's what it takes to get people to, you know, go do things that take up space on a blockchain is economic incentive. So, Mike, how can how can our listeners follow you um, for your next venture or whatever you decide to do? Do you, uh, you have a Twitter or a website or? You know, I do have a Twitter account as Casatius. Um, I am not active on social media in the sense that I'm not publishing much lately. Um, but I would, uh, I would use my Twitter account as being the place where you're going to hear about whatever's next for me when I start making noise. My last question: Where'd you get the name Casatius? I literally made it up. 
Where did I get the name Cassatius? I literally made it up. And here's how it worked. Once upon a time, I'm like, you know what? I need a new name that really reflects me. But I'm trying to think of all the names. Like I, I'd used Bowser for the longest time because, wow, I was a fan of Mario. But I don't know that Mario is what really defines me. And, you know, I, of, of all these different names, you know, I can't think of a pop culture icon that really defines me or something, you know, a character that defines me. And I wanted a name that was unique. I didn't want, you know, I mean, I like going onto a website and be able to say, okay, that's my name, that's me. So, um, you know, a, a phrase that um, really stood out to me was call a spade a spade, because one of the things, you know, a, a core principle for me is, you know, asking the question, you know, why do we call things what they aren't? Why, why, why do we have all these convenient names or, you know, Fiction, I, I guess political call correctness, fiction. all these things. Yeah. Yeah. Why, you know, what's wrong with calling a spade a spade? And so I took that as, okay, maybe that's a character trait or something like that, that I could wrap into a name. So C A S A S. I'm like, okay, yeah, well, Casas. Well, Casas, that means houses in Spanish. Well, that has nothing to do with me. But, um, you know, I, I, I took the name, you took the letter C A S A S and thought, okay, Confucius? what if I, well, Confucius. I wasn't thinking about Confucius. I was thinking more about Shakespeare and what kind of a what kind of an ending could I put on C A S A S to make it sound like you know something from you know the Roman days, but it, like uh. a character, like sounds like a person's name, but it isn't really. And so I, it, you know, Cassatius is basically C A S A S with a Latinized, Romanized suffix that sounds like it's the name of a person. And it, it stuck. And I, I actually came up with the name before I even came up with the idea of doing coins. But when it was, you know, when I started doing the coins, it's like, wow, Cassatius coins. OK, that has a lot of characteristics that rolls off planned, the tongue, but it rolls off the tongue and it kind of has a little bit of an allure. Quite honestly, when people struggle to pronounce it, that wasn't intentional. Like, I'm not trying to frustrate people. But, you know, when people say, you know, how do we pronounce Louis Vuitton or how do we pronounce, you know, Prada, you know, like a lot of these names, they have foreign you know, you know origin and it makes people say, OK, do I am I pronouncing this correctly? And all of a sudden, just by accident, I have people struggling to make sure they pronounce my name correctly which you know i'm i'm like you know i'm just kind of like wow that was by accident but i'll go for it um you know and you know it is what it is and uh, you know i feel like that was a matter of luck i'm i'm happy with how i came up with the name and then an important aspect of choosing the name was to google it and make sure that it was a word no one else had ever created because i didn't want to copy anything from anyone else for this so that was i'm i'm pretty sure that's a word that's never been used before yeah, so that's what it had to be. If it, if someone else had used the word, I would have picked something else. Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank um, you, Charlie, for the invitation. It was this my has been pleasure. wonderful, and I can't wait to actually listen to this episode myself, to be Me honest, too. when it's released. Me too. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mike, and, and have a great week. Thank you. Have a good one. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. New episodes of Untold Stories go live every Tuesday at 7 a.m. EST. Links to our Apple and Spotify channels are in the show notes. You can also follow me on Twitter, Charlie Shrem, to continue the conversation. See you next week.